So a quick introduction to Dr. Farooq Langdana for all the viewers with us. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, yeah. All right, so Dr. Langdana's areas of specialization include monetary and fiscal theory and international trade and global macroeconomic policy. His research deals with macroeconomics experimentation and the role of stabilization policy in an expectations-driven economy. Uh, he has published several articles as well as five books in this area. His new book co-authored with Peter Murphy and published by Springer Press is titled International Trade and Global Macro Policy. Dr. Langdana is the recipient of the Horst de Podwin Research Award and more than 30 teaching awards, including the highest possible teaching award at Rutgers University, the Warren I. Sussman Award. He also has received Rutgers Business School's Paul Nadler Award for Excellence in Teaching. Uh, from 2011 to 2013, the Award of Excellence in Teaching in the MBA program was named the Farooq Langnana Teaching Excellence Award. With that, over to, over to you, uh, Dr. Langnana. Thank you so much, um, Aditya, and thank you so much, uh, Indu. Very kind introductions, and good evening, everyone. I wish I could see you all face to face, maybe sometime in the near future. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to get straight into the, the, the discussion. But before I start, um, Indu mentioned that I was there. I was invited there. I was the first speaker in the new building. And it was 2016. And I remember telling people that we, have, we, may, have a, we may have a problem on our hands. And by the way, yes, I predicted Trump would win, but I had nothing to do with the victory. So don't blame me, please. Um, anyway, so I predicted then that it, this was not going to go down well. And I said, you know, who knows how this is going to work when I see you next time, a year from now. And there was a parent, there was a lady in the class in the session. And she said, don't worry, by the time you get back next year, he will be impeached. He will be in jail. And I remember saying, you know, Aapke mein ghi shakkar. And everyone started clapping. And I thought, Chalo ho gaya kaam. It's taken care of. And so if that lady is still there, if you're in the audience, identify yourself. And I have to tell you, I, well, he's still there. Nothing has happened. You know, do something about it. You know, so um, all those memories come back. So if you're there, I'm saying hi to you. And uh, anyway. So this session, I have, I think, 40 minutes, and then we have question and answers after that. So I'm going to go right into it, and I should tell you up front, yeah, um, take notes. This is going to be somewhat intense, um, but Aditya will be sending you a blog I wrote just a few days ago, which has everything I'm saying, plus some more, but a little less detail than some of the areas I'm going into. So look for the blog that Aditya will be sending you after the session or towards the end. And um, and what I'm going to be doing is doing the bedrock theory, OK? So this will be the theory that applies to virtually all countries. And I'll be sticking with the theory. So if you have idiosyncratic, like detailed questions, like, you know, what about yesterday's announcement by the Reserve Bank or what about Modi's comment he made, he made two days ago, we won't be able to get into that kind of detail. I'm doing the bedrock theory. Um, and of course, save all the questions and Aditya will be funneling the questions to me. If there are some pressing questions in the middle, we have a, a provision to interrupt myself and, and do it. So let's switch to the whiteboard and let's get into this. Okay. and. Uh, Um, here we go, just, all right. So I'm going to start with ground zero, so to speak. We're going to discuss modern monetary theory. And at this point, uh, do you see me as the thumbnail and you see the whiteboard, everyone? Um, yes. Okay, great. Thank yes. you for nodding. Great. And so I'm going to start from ground zero, from scratch. Aditya is an economist. I know Indu is also an economist. I know she studied economics. And so for some of you, just hang in there with me. You've seen this before. Maybe it's a refresher. For some of you, you may be seeing some of this for the first time. So I'm just going to bring everybody up to speed and get into where modern monetary theory comes from. And then maybe 
towards the end, speak about India just a little bit um, towards the end, but let's start with a general theory. Okay, so let's start with budget deficits. So here we go. Um, okay, so budget deficits, G minus T greater than zero. Let's start very simple. So G is government spending, is government spending. T is taxes and government spending greater than taxes. That's a budget deficit. And um, how is this deficit financed? So just the tip of the iceberg here, moving really quickly. So the typically a budget deficit is financed responsibly by borrowing. The, so the treasury government, if you will, issues bonds, that's called sovereign debt. And the country that can borrow or needs to borrow has to be a safe haven country. It can't be a country where there are coups and revolutions every few weeks, obviously. So relatively stable, relatively safe, they issue bonds and they borrow. It's bond financed. And that's the sensible, um, that's what Keynes actually uh, described. This is the responsible way to finance a budget deficit. And how long can you keep doing that? So if you have G minus T, which is the budget deficit greater than zero, divided by Y, and that's the GDP. That's the size of the economy, so GDP. If that is less than 5%, then that's known as a sustainable bond financed budget deficit. Sustainable. Sustainable. What sustainable means is that um, you can keep rolling over the deficit. Um, you can, so in other words, if I borrow from Shia this year and I'm the government and I'm borrowing for, for one year from you, Shia, it's time to pay you back next year. I borrow from Tanishk next year. And Tanish represents a large Japanese insurance company. And the time to pay back Tanish the following year, I borrow from Subhashish, who represents a big Brazilian conglomerate who's lending to my country. And then to Anji and Bawani and so on. You can roll it over to infinity. So, you know, you keep rolling over the debt and that's a sustainable deficit. Okay. At 5%. It's 5% typically for mature economies. For emerging economies, transition economies, um, it's about eight to nine percent, around eight percent. You know, so so emerging economies, this number is more like eight percent. For mature economies, U.S., Japan, the eurozone, it's five percent. For the eurozone, actually, the num they made the number three percent. If you want to join the Euro Club, you better get that number under three percent. This the Germans push this through. It's called the Stability Pact. Anyway, so there is an upper limit. And let's see um, if I can, Aditya, this uh, people entering the waiting room is blocking my eraser here. So let's go All to, right. um, and yeah, if we can get rid of that. All right, that's good. done, yeah. I'm still seeing a little box covering up my eraser and my toolbar. So, anyway, so while we while he's fixing this, if the ratio is greater than five percent, then that is non-sustainable. Okay, so a non-sustainable deficit would be something where suddenly the rest of the world stops lending to you. They think, wow, their deficits are too high, and they stop sending money to your country. They stop buying your bonds. And so that's non sustainable for emerging economies, probably more than 8% for mature economies, more than 5%. What this means is that the options after that, when you become non sustainable, all the red lights come on and the option is you print money. So here we go. I'm taking you into it. You print money like a mad person. It's called monetization. And that is very dangerous because this is how hyperinflations happen. Um, virtually all hyperinflations began with non-sustainable deficits greater than 5%. And that's completely damaging. Um, for Let me give you some numbers. The Hungarian hyperinflation, so when you printed money and you printed money, non-sustainable deficit was something like 42 times 10 raised to 15% inflation. 
uh, I'm just giving you some idea of the magnitude of the disaster. That's the inflation. Um, I actually brought some display items for you. I've got Zimbabwean hyperinflation currency and I'm hoping you can see this. This is 100 trillion. 100 trillion, by the way, Zimbabwe currency, 100 trillion. I've got all kinds, got German hyperinflation currency too. So hyperinflation, it's essentially the end of the regime. The government goes, your whole life savings go. All the people like you, educated people, leave the country, gone, 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 gone. Um, complete disaster. Now, keep in mind, here is where it gets interesting. The hyperinflation only happens, only, only happens when the money that's printed goes into circulation. So here we are uh, backing up here in the United States, the deficit ratio went to 6.2% in the Reagan administration. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and all the red lights went on, came on and they brought it down under 5%. Then came the subprime crisis, the housing crisis, the big recession here, 2008, 9, 10. And it went to 12%, this ratio. And everyone thought, oh gosh, here we, this is major non-sustainable. We'll be printing money. It's over. I remember I was in Shanghai teaching um, an evening class there in our executive MBA program. And... Um, I got this text from one of the central bankers that our American deficit GDP ratio is going to be 12%. Remember, the highest was 6.2% in the Reagan administration. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is over. <laughs> you know, I just, I should walk out into traffic. It's over. And luckily, it wasn't over. The sky didn't fall on our heads. The hyperinflation did not happen. Uh, today, I'm just fast forwarding, it's almost 14%, the deficit GDP ratio here. And in virtually all countries on the planet, this number is rising fast, not in India, interestingly. And so the sky is not falling on our head. What happened? And what happened is, in plain English, listen very carefully now, hyperinflations happen only, only, only when the massive, obscene amount of money that's printed actually gets spent, actually gets injected in the economy. So in the subprime crisis, when this number was 12% here, um, Aditya, if I can remove these photographs, I can go to the next page. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. And so what you have here is number today is around 13, 14% actually. And so in the subprime crisis, it was 12% and the sky did not fall on our heads. The money has to go and has to be spent. It wasn't. What happened is that it's something called a liquidity trap. We printed all this money and everybody was buying gold and people were expecting inflation. Nothing happened. There was no inflation. Thank you, Aditya. There was no inflation. Nothing happened. And it's so it's almost like, you know, in and the blog you will read this evening, tomorrow. It's almost like when you get when one gets bit by a poisonous snake. The venom is only dangerous if it enters the bloodstream. If it doesn't enter the bloodstream, you're fine. And as I said in a blog, please don't experiment with this at home. I'm not a global expert on venoms, but you get the point, right? It, <laughs> it should be in circulation. So what happened in the subprime crisis, we printed something like $48 billion a month for from 2007 to 2015, 48 billion a month. What happened is we had all these guys, all these lenders, banks, hedge funds, they had lent money to all these people who buy these mansions and there was no security check. We threw away all the regulations. So Janta could buy mansions. You made up your income. I had a, a, a student in my executive MBA class who said his, he had his company. He said he was lending a million dollars a day during the crisis and people would come in and go, what's your income? Yeah, put a million dollars. You know what, put 1.5 million dollars. No documentation, it's called a no doc loan. Janta was borrowing <clears throat> and this guy said, I knew Farouk that these guys would couldn't make the payments. And I said, so what did you do? 
He said, in two days, I would sell the mortgage. I would sell the loan to somebody else. He said, it's like a game of musical chairs. <clears throat> Once the bottom falls out, the people who are left standing are stuck with those rotten mortgages. And it was a terrifying moment. And so that's what happened. When the bottom fell out, all the lenders who were stuck with all these mortgages that those guys could not pay were stranded. And what did Uncle Sam do? The US Treasury, Ben Bernanke, <clears throat> he bought all those rotten mortgages and printed money, printed money, printed money, 48 billion a month from 2007 to 2015. And, it, and so I'm going to show you a diagram here. So this, those of you who remember your macro, here is my, uh, let's take this back up. Okay, let's take this back up here. So here we are. Here is money supply. And here is money demand. And here is interest rates. And here is zero interest rate. Somewhere like this, zero. And so we printed money, printed money supply increased all the way it went below zero. And technically you couldn't have interest rates below zero. So America was sitting at almost 0% and all this increase in money supply as we bought the rotten oranges, the, like bags of oranges is what I call them, rotten oranges. And we bought the money and bought the money and we had this huge amount of liquidity stuck sitting there in the American economy, just sitting there because People weren't borrowing at that point. No one was investing in houses and lenders weren't lending. And that was called quantitative easing. So this is a diagram for quantitative easing, which is simply buying bonds, buying junk bonds, buying horrible stuff and printing money, printing money like a mad person. And it just sits there. If it just sits there, folks, <clears throat> there is no hyperinflation. In the Hungarian hyperinflation, excuse me, in the German hyperinflation, When I showed you that Zimbabwe note here, when we printed the money, it was already spent. When they printed the money in this Zimbabwe inflation, 100 trillion, it was already spent. You're already paying teachers, soldiers, farmers who had not been paid for the last six months uh, for supplies, for petrol, for medical supplies. They had not been paid for the last three months. So when you printed the money, it, it was in circulation and hyperinflation took off. In this case here in the subprime crisis, it just sat there and there was no hyperinflation. And, and I was oblivious to be honest, I was working on my fifth book and I'll never forget the owner of the eighth largest hedge fund in the world came into my office, it's 2008 at the beginning of this whole crisis, came in with two of his IDs and he only has 12 clients. Can you imagine how huge these investors are. So he sits down and he's like laughing his head off. He's like, Frog, what a great country this is. I fully expected to go bankrupt. And Ben Bernanke is buying all these rotten bonds. He's used another word which I can't use. All these rotten bonds from me, printing money. I'm saved. I've been bailed out. What a great country this is. And sadly, <clears throat> mom and pop got shafted. Mom and pop America, and I'm like Hindu now. <clears throat> so, excuse me folks, my allergies are wiping me out today. And so mom and pop America, so I would do a lot of talking all over the country and mom and pop America would really come at me and say, Professor, how come we weren't bailed out? We had a corner grocery store and we were two months late and we lost it or we were three months late on the mortgage or two months late and we lost our house. How come those investment bankers and mortgage and big hedge fund guys are being bailed out and America is buying all the rotten mortgages and printing money and helping them? How come? And they're pointing to me. Said, you Northeast economists made this happen. You looking at me, your $10,000 suits made it happen. And I would stop them and say, first of all, regarding the suits, not a $10,000 suit guy. I wait till I go home to Bombay and I go to Raymond's near Akbarali, which this is from Raymond's. And so don't confuse me. I'm not a $10,000. First of all, I'm not that. But anyway, so that was the world. We printed all this money and it sat there, quantitative easing. 
and there was no hyperinflation because it didn't go into the, the, the poison, did not go into the bloodstream. And so this was a revelation to people that, aha, you can print monumental amounts of money. We printed more money in America than Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, all the hyperinflation countries of the past, more than that. We don't even know, maybe it's 35 trillion, uh, maybe it's 28 trillion, we don't even know. And please understand, you know, nowadays people throw around the word trillion. You have to understand what that means, folks. One trillion dollars, I listen carefully, please. If you spend a million dollars an hour, spend a million dollars an hour, 24 hours in a day, day and night, you spend a million dollars an hour, it will take you 109 years to spend one trillion. So think about that. <laughs> and America's <coughs> printing now is going to be probably more like 10 trillion by the time we're done. We already had 3 trillion here. Uh, and I'll take, I'm moving to that uh, soon. So that's the, so in other words, if you were to go back when Gandhiji was doing the Satyagra thing, if you started spending a million dollars an hour, right about now, he would be finishing $1 trillion. So that's the magnitude I'm talking about. It's huge. Okay, so fast forward now. So this is what happened. The sky didn't fall on our heads and the whole world is watching this. They're going, aha. And first, but then how come we didn't have interest? So as interest rates went down almost to zero, how come the economy, which is GDP, did not jump up? What happened? Nothing really happened. So we print all this money. When you print money, you lower interest rates. We were almost at zero. Why does it not happen? That's because it's called it's something called a liquidity trap. And I'm gonna, I'm sure some of you remember this from your old days, liquidity trap. And this is how it works. This is I is I bar minus I. That's a simple version. So I here is borrowing by the private, by you guys, private companies. So this is borrowing for capital investment, buying new houses, building factories, offices, capital investment. This is borrowing, private borrowing. I is the interest rate. Right now, it's just a short-term interest rate. You don't have time to do the long-term stuff right now. So short-term interest rate. And I bar is investor confidence. I bar. So look at this equation. It's very straightforward. If interest, so the, here is the DNA. This is the motherboard of monetary policy, right? We've all seen this. When the central bank lowers interest rates, so Reserve Bank of India, Mr. Das, lowers interest rates, the economy should improve. Janta borrows, factories, houses, capital investment, new businesses. So that's the magic button. You lower interest rates and capital invest borrowing goes up. But what would happen, and here's the important point, you lower interest rates almost to zero, and let's go with red, and this is done by a huge increase in printed money. Okay, so you're printing money, increasing the money supply, I'll show you the diagram, the quantitative easing, increasing money supply, so you're printing money, you're lowering the interest rate, this, this economy should jumpstart. You went from 6% to 0%. Can you see why it might not jumpstart? Look at that equation. What else could happen in that equation that would cancel the effect of lowered interest rates? That would be this. If investor confidence is also low, and here is a huge point, everyone, and this is what, you know, the Economist magazine a few weeks ago, they completely missed this point. Most analysts miss this point. Investor, if investor confidence is also low, nothing happens. It cancels out the effect of the low interest rates. So if investor confidence I bar is low because of a trade war, because of some political hassle, because of US China battles, because of too much taxes, because of too much regulation, some of you are probably nodding, because of all, any kind of um, malfeasance, terrorism, whatever, 
um, bad harvests. If investor confidence is low, then low interest rates will do nothing. It will, the money will sit there. Think about it. If I were to tell you, you know, uh, Gurjas, interest rates are at 0.5%. Chalo, loan le lijiye. Um, borrow 2 million and start a massive consulting company. Chalo, chalo, Gurjas, let's do it. Gurjas will go. <laughs> It's going to be a, to a year and a half before I come online and given the state of the world, who the heck wants, even if you're lending to me at 0.5%, who the heck wants to borrow? So to keep in mind, this baby, sorry, <laughs> investor confidence, uh, too many moving parts in Zoom. I, this is the first time I'm using Zoom, by the way, so I apologize in advance. I typically use another package. And so investor confidence is the main guy. So Gurjas will go, to, thank you, Farooq, 0.5%, Acha, great rate, hai, lekin, why the heck would I borrow? Because in a year and a half, I'm looking around, I'm just making up a hypothetical situation. It's not nearly that bad, Gurjas. So anyway, and so looking around, there's a trade war, there's China, there is this, there's that, COVID is coming back. Nay, nay, forget it. And so remember, Ibar is the guy in the six o'clock news. They don't understand that, you know, oh, the central bank lowered interest rates 0 0.25, 25 basis points, and the stock market went up. It's not an automatic thing. It's not like a digital button, like you lower interest rates and boom, the economy goes up. It's all about this and you very, you can't really control this. It's confidence. It's investor confidence. It's endogenous. Anyway, so <clears throat> that's called a liquidity trap. You're trapped. You have all this liquidity, all this money sitting around, and it sits there. The banks aren't lending, you're not borrowing. And therefore, inflation is not there. The hyperinflation didn't happen. So the liquidity trap is a necessary condition for what I'm about to tell you next. So please, everybody, get that. And I'm going to show you why India is probably not in a liquidity trap situation. So at the very, uh, towards the end. So. That's the necessary condition. And let's go to the next board. And so MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. Here we are using this backdrop, Modern Monetary Theory. So this is actually, first of all, there's nothing modern and it's not a theory, okay? So this actually became fashionable when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Saunders, remember Bernie Saunders who was running for president? They made this popular. They came up with this name, this title, MMT. And interestingly now, Trump is doing it. South Korea is doing it. Brazil is doing it. <clears throat> South Africa is doing it. India is wondering aloud, should we? Uh, maybe not. Uh, we'll see. And so what this is very simply is that number one, money has lost, money has basically lost power lost its mojo, lost its money has been emasculated, liquidity trap. So basically gone are the days when Janta would announce such as central bank has lowered interest rates 25 basis points and oh, the market would go up and people would rejoice and more jobs would be created, gone. Silence, Liquid, they're ignoring it, it's not a big deal. Number two, massive increases in money led to no hyperinflation. And pi is inflation in macro, as you remember. So guys, where is that? And so they're running around and these guys who believe in MMT have hajar attitude. They're running around like, so where's your hyperinflation? Huh? You're sitting on gold? Kaha hai? Kya hua? And so no hyperinflation. And so three, the role of money is to be a servant for government spending. So this is the boss. G government spending is a boss. Money has lost that, that huge value, that power. It's emasculated, lost its mojo. And the only role for money is to be a servant to G. Basically, G is to spend G and you print money to pay for it because there will be no hyperinflation. And so here comes Bernie Saunders and says, you want free college education? And of course, people are screaming and lifting him up and carrying him out. He says, I will give you free college education. And all you parents out there are thinking, aha, telling your kids, please go to America, free college education. Um, and you want green jobs? 
No problem, green job, just print money. Five trillion, one trillion, people don't understand what a trillion is. 109 years at a million dollars an hour from Gandhiji Satyagraha to today, that's one trillion. And so print money, modern monetary theory. And so when this was breaking, guys like me were shocked. We were lying awake at night thinking, oh my God, these guys are printing money. And I came up with this term, I call it um, basically, um, you know, in law, you have something called circumstantial evidence in law. And I'm sure there are lawyers out there. Um, circumstantial evidence is very simply, um, um, we have uh, Jeel, Jeel, so here you are, I'm looking at Jeel here. So the, somebody broke into the museum and he was wearing a rust colored t-shirt and Jeel, you're wearing a rust colored t-shirt. You broke into the museum. Chalo. Let's grab Jeel. That's circumstantial evidence, you know, because it happened and you got one date, piece of data matching. Chalo. It's the, it's the right solution. And so I call this circumstantial macro. Just because there was no hyperinflation last time, given the liquidity trap, you couldn't do it again. Thinking, Chalo, there's no hyperinflation. Keep doing it. And keep doing it. As long as, it, and the paradox, the perverse nature of MMT is that as long as confidence stays down, you can print money. God forbid confidence goes up and people are ebullient and I bar, which is investor confidence and C bar, which is consumer confidence, which I haven't even defined, goes up, we have a problem. Janta starts borrowing all this money and spending it and whoop, 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 inflation rate will go up fast. Gold prices will, gold futures will take off right away. And so it's this perverse sort of logic. And the way I see it, I have a great example for you, circumstantial behavior. So um, here you are, Kaf Parade, where my parents lived, tall building. And there was, there was a fire a few days ago, which actually fits into my example. There's a guy on this top, the balcony and this tall building. He gets a huge barbecue and he lights it. Totally against society rules, of course, for obvious reasons. And he's barbecuing vegetables. We are vegetarians here, so let's do vegetables. You know, bygones are being barbecued and corn and puttas and so on. And the lady upstairs is leaning over from a balcony with a bucket of water going, what are you doing? You're gonna burn the house down. And the guy's looking up and going, Madam, Madam, please go back inside. Don't throw water on my bygones because the wind is blowing in this direction. You will be okay, Madam. And nothing happens. And so next week, he's back there with a bigger barbecue and more bygones. And this time, gobies being barbecued. And there she's hanging on the balcony and going, what are you doing? And he's going, no, no, Madam, the wind is blowing in the right direction. Nothing's going to happen. So this is where we are. <coughs> this is where, excuse me, guys, I'm going to get me some water. Sorry. And so this is in a nutshell, um, modern monetary theory, where, again, the necessary condition is a liquidity trap has to exist and you print money um, hand over foot, um, like mad person. And somebody will ask me, so you guys are thinking about this, but wait a minute, is there no anchor for money? Isn't money tied to gold or some sort of a, is there no upper limit? And I'm sure many of you know this, right? The answer is not anymore, not since 1971. Um, August 15th of August, 1971. And somebody said, Farouk, how do you remember these dates? And I said, 15th of August is a date I remember, I know. So, um, and so what happened there is, and some of you remember from your economics classes, there was an exchange rate system called Bretton Woods. And America was supposed to make sure that gold cost $35 an ounce. And to ensure that America would not print money because you start printing money, inflation happens and gold price goes up. So that was the discipline. America would ensure gold car price, <coughs> excuse me, $35 an ounce and the rest of the world would be pegged to the American currency. 
So, you know, three Deutschmarks to one dollar or five French francs to one dollar, those were all fixed exchange rates. And what happened is in the Nixon administration, Vietnam War was happening. So Nixon was chup chap printing money. Remember, Nixon was a chalu. Not nearly a chalu as what we have now. He's a, he was a boy scout compared to what we have now. And by the way, if I disappear, tell the world my story. But anyway, so Nixon was basically printing money, chup chap. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. The thing is, you can't fool markets. So markets caught on that this was happening. So gold started going up on the black market. <clears throat> so gold was officially $35 an ounce. On the black market, remember, you can't fool markets. You know, you have China managing its stock market. We have here in the US, George Bush Sr. managing the stock market. It should be like Modi telling the the central bank person uh, does to buy stocks, Indian shares, to artificially bring up the stock price. <laughs> you, know, you know, and um, so you can't do that. You can't fool markets, no matter how hard you try. So gold started going up, 35, 38, 45. And so who figures out something is, there is something dal mein kuch kala hai. Who figured it out? It's either Indians or Chinese, right? So the Chinese figured it out. Aha, something's going on. And so they bought gold officially at $35 an ounce, since that's the official rate. And they sold it in the black market at $48 an ounce. And so suddenly the world caught on that we were printing money in the US. This is 71. And at that time, you could exchange a dollar for gold. You know, that was the deal. And so, and so the French sent a battleship. This is high drama. I mean, some days they should make a movie on this. They sent a battleship to New York to say, Chilo, we know there is something going on here. We have, you owe us all this money. We would like it in gold, please. And we have a ship waiting. So remember, America had three quarters of the world's gold. So the French said, we want our share. We, we want all the money in French francs that you have, pay us back in gold because we don't trust you. And then the, on th this happened on Tuesday. On Thursday, the British said, we want our gold. At that point, if we had done that, America would have lost 80% of its gold. Kind of like what happened in India in, I think, 91 with the gold crisis, with the Singh government. And so Nixon said, that's it, no way. The, the heck with it. No more gold window. So he shut down the gold window and nothing was backing the dollar after that. Nothing was backing global currencies. Um, and and so everyone thought, okay, well, we need an anchor. And paradoxically, and this is what's so sad about this whole story, paradoxically, for the next 20, 30 years, we had amazing monetary policy. We had Volcker, we had Greenspan, we had central bank leaders who were superb. They, they had upper limits, they were disciplined. And they acted like they had some sort of a, an anchor even though there was all fiat money. Fiat money is printing money, there's no anchor, there is no goal, there's nothing stopping it from going crazy. And then in the subprime crisis, we printed money and we printed money. And I should tell you, by the way, when we printed money and nothing happened to capital investment, the liquidity trap, I have a great quote from somebody who I really admire and who sadly is not there in, in your central bank anymore. I'm talking of Raghuram Rajan, of course. I have a great quote by him. So when we printed money and printed money because of the liquidity trap, because IBAR was low, nothing happened. This is what he said. He said, never in the field of economic policy has so much been spent with so little evidence by so few. Obviously, a Churchillian kind of takeoff, which is beautiful, perfect. You know, so you printed the money, it just sat there. So that's modern monetary theory, no gold standard. Um, so now we are running amok. And by the way, people are today talking about having a gold standard and it's too late. There's not enough gold out there. Um, so I wanna swing over to just India here for obvious reasons. So something happened in September 
2019, last September, to me that was huge, which gives me tremendous hope, by the way. And so what happened in September 2019? So, okay, so there are two Modi's. This is my opinion, please. Anything I say is my opinion. It's not Rutgers. Don't get my business school in trouble. <laughs> you can get me in trouble. So there are two Modi's. One is the reformist Modi of early vintage Gujarat. And then there's a conservative Modi who we see a lot of nowadays, you know, protectionist, inward looking, more worried about global connections, and domestic economy. Some of the Gujarat stuff is kind of gone. So there are two Modi. So suddenly there was a burst of progressive Modi last September when corporate taxes were slashed from 35% to 25% in India. And so what happened next was amazing. The stock market exploded. Yes, you all remember that? Biggest increase in 10 years. That's not the important point. The point here is that the market was straining. It was waiting. The Indian economy needs an excuse to explode. It's dying to race forward. This does not happen in other economies. You could cut taxes here right now. Nothing would happen. In the Eurozone, nothing would happen, guys. China, nothing. India is the economy, the way I see it, it's like a racehorse that wants to race. So the economy, the corporate America, the business people went, aha, cello. Now let's go forward and let's do what was dropped, what was blocked by that crazy demonetization. You know, before the demonetization, we were racing. We were heading to number one spot, guys. Um, so that tax cut last year, huge increase in I-bar and C-bar, which is consumer confidence. The racehorse wants to race, but it's not being allowed to race. That's the problem. You know, the, it's not, the racehorse is at bandstand, taking children around. And so, are there still horses in bandstand? Anybody not, not? Not anymore, but uh, yeah, we have a few on the uh, other side. Okay, so basically horses near bandstand. I, my, my dad would take me every weekend and, and I had a, anyway. So that's the thing. So that was a very hopeful sign that C-bar and I-bar are just dying, just racing to get out there. And that's huge because, you know, you cannot. And the other thing, another good thing about India is we still have a lot of infrastructure to do. Um, China has done, infrastructure is low hanging fruit. You reach up and you grab the fruit. It's low hanging fruit. China has done it. China is now in part two. China is now in China 2.0, <clears throat> as we know, which is innovation. <clears throat> that is the hard part. You know, that's when, you know, we have Chinese innovation going head to head with American and Indian. You know, this is the tough part, innovation. Infrastructure is low hanging fruit and we have tons more to do. And if we can do the infrastructure where the migrant workers have gone, pay them back, help them out. That would solve this, that would help this wound that is, that's recently occurred in the country. We have so much more infrastructure to do in the, in India. And, but the thing is we can't do MMT because remember modern monetary theory requires low C bar and I bar, you see? So if we, if we were to jumpstart printing tons of money, that money would be in circulation. Uh, you saw what happened when we cut taxes and whoa, the economy uh, took off and stock market took off. So that option, that button, the MMT button, which is a good thing, by the way, uh, is not available to us. What we do have is the G button, government spending. Our deficit GDP ratio is around 6%. We can aram say go to eight, nine percent in India. A serious infrastructure spending serious decrease in regulations and tax cuts. Um, so there is lots of hope, you know, for some bold macroeconomic move to jumpstart the Indian economy. And uh, in my last couple of comments here, before I take questions, um, so I had a reporter call me yesterday, day before, you know, with, with COVID, you don't know what's habit day it is. Um, and so we are talking about policies and and I told him that, you know what, the cure for COVID um, coronavirus. And I said, that's not gonna be the end all of the story. 
because there will be another shock like COVID coming. And, and the question was, will this be like the Great Depression? And I said, no, no, you have to understand something very different that happened here. In the last few recessions in India and here in China and Europe, the last few recessions, there were internal problems. A bubble burst or a soft landing became a hard landing. Those were internal systemic failures. This time around, it was external. We switched off our economies. It was an exogenous supply side shock for those of you who remember your economics. So it came from outside and the only cure, not cure, but the only way we could give our, health inst our healthcare institutions a chance was to deliberately turn off the lights and switch off the economy. Very different from a bubble collapsing or an internal market failure. So even though the numbers might look like Great Depression numbers and they're actually worse here, the similarity ends there. Now, when we turn on the lights, there will be a V-shaped recovery, but the leg of the recovery will be shorter. So V-shaped, but a shorter leg, because the obvious sectors of the economy that can go online will go online. Our productivity will go up because now fewer people can do what more used to do, and managers will realize that. They'll realize also they need less fixed capital, office space, and so on. So fewer people will be doing as much work. So productivity will go up. Inflation, that'll keep inflation down, but we will be more pressure on innovation and jobs. But for us in India, we have infrastructure to do, hajar infrastructure spending still to do. We need it. And so that's actually a good thing, unlike China where they're done with infrastructure. And so will the COVID cure end all this? And by the way, at Rutgers, we are very proud the first FDA COVID or coronavirus test was from Rutgers. And the second COVID test was also related to Rutgers. There's a student in my executive MBA class. He's a doctor. He works for Mount Sinai and um, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Jang. And so he was in the team that got the second COVID test. So at Rutgers, we are very proud of that. Now, if you can find a cure, we'll be even more proud. And so the reporter said, so will that be the end? And I said, no, there'll be more shocks coming. That's not the end. I said, the real problem here is a problem of global leadership. And I'm going to end on this note, Aditya, just another minute. Um, global leadership is the real issue. And uh, without naming any names, all over the planet, if you look, you see leaders having almost similar profiles. Now, inward looking, insecure, xenophobic, look at our Namona and, and I'm still waiting for that lady to convince me that he's going to be locked up soon. Um, and so all over the planet in a bizarre fashion, in many large economies, and that's the necessary condition before, before we move forward in any of our countries, this is a leadership issue. And as Lincoln said, you know, a house divided cannot stand. And I want to expand that for the house to be the whole planet. You know, our planet divided cannot stand. So I'm hoping that we all get a generation of leaders who are open-minded and who are inclusive, um, kind of like a John F. Kennedy. You know, I, I said, you see in my blog, one of my earliest memories in Bombay was my mom crying. I was very young then, and, um, and she's a doctor. So hard as nails, never cry. And so this was very incongruous. And I asked her, I said, mom, what's happening? And she said, oh, President Kennedy was assassinated. And as a kid, I was thinking, he must be an amazing guy. He was assassinated in Dallas and my mom in Mumbai, across in the Parsi hospital, across from the cathedral school, she is crying. He was a unifier. He was a uniter. And um, that's the kind of person we need all over the planet because the house divided cannot stand. Thank you very much for being with me this uh, evening. I'll be glad to take any questions now. Thanks, Farooq. Uh, quickly, very quickly summarizing every bit that you spoke about. I'll keep it short and simple. Uh, so obviously you started with uh, uh, the bedrock theory is what you called uh, uh, your session for the day. Uh, obviously you uh, went on to talking about the modern monetary theory. Uh, the, the equation that we started with was uh, the budget deficit uh, and then the explanation of what is a sustainable bond finance and what's a 
uh, sustainable sort of growth in the deficit. Uh, so obviously the model about G minus T over GDP. So I'm just going to repeat that once again. I hope all the students have got that uh, in your notes as well. Hyperinflation, uh, also with the example, you saw the currency right there. So just pinpointing that one point. And uh, mostly, most of our macroeconomic classes end up with this one question for sure is why can't we just keep printing more and more money? Uh, which is a very econ uh, 101 sort of a class question, but you know it gets more and more difficult for us to always answer that question, no matter how easy it is to explain. So I, I like the fact that you picked up on that point as well. Um, so you also explain the different percentage rates of you know GDP uh, deficit, uh, the ratios of emerging economies to uh, developed economies, um, also about uh, the Hungarian and the German hyperinflation. Um, also, mom and pop America, when you spoke about the case in hand and how that was an era of, uh, you know, a generational difference that you were trying to make. Um, quantitative easing and uh, liquidity trap, two of the uh, concepts that probably we go back down in, you know, uh, history of economics or macroeconomic policy theory is what we study. Um, obviously, three reasons uh, or three basic points under MMT. Uh, so money has lost its power, massive, uh, uh, so there's massive influx in, in sort of the money supply that we were talking about. And uh, basically money is a servant for government spending. Uh, that was another theory that we picked up. Uh, went back into, you know, brief history of Bretton Woods and correlation to how did it all start and what was the gold reserves and how did we pick up. You also quoted, uh, you know, about the battleship to New York. So. That was another, I think I, I liked that point, uh, you know, how paying back in gold. And one thing uh, came to my mind was a contrast with demonetization when everyone just wanted the cash uh, right there. Uh, so that was a contrast yeah. that I drew uh, right you. there. Um, and then obviously quoting Raghuram Rajan himself, uh, Dr. Raghuram Rajan himself. Uh, and then the contrast between the reformist uh, Modi and the confirmist Modi which uh, I think was a new insight as well. Um, and we are not going to quote you for that, so don't worry. Uh, and obviously the V-shaped uh, recovery, the supply side shock, and you ended with the John S. Kennedy story. So brilliant uh, insights, I would say. We'll go on to the questions. The first question, I think, is a mix of uh, you know macro and sort of also your opinion. So I'll just read it out for you. This comes from uh, one of our students in the economics class. His name is uh, Yash Kedia. To jumpstart the Indian economy, we can have increased government spending and decreased taxes. Once this happens, and as the economy starts to mature, how can we lower budget deficit from 8 to 9% to below 5%? Yeah, great question. And actually, I'm looking at a question from uh, Dr. Indu Shahani here to everyone. How could the government have handled the migrants issue better? So I'm going to combine stuff here. Um, but going back to Yash's question, you know, the the original supply siders, so David Stockman and Reagan, so they were a little extreme. They would say things like, Chalo, you cut tax rates, but you will increase tax revenues. Um, so in other words, I tell you Ireland, the story of Ireland. Come to Ireland and build computers. So Dell is there, Gateway is there, no taxes. Five years, no taxes. However, so, so, the, rate, so the lower the tax rates, however, when you go there to build computers, you, you've got employees there, you're eating out, you're buying houses, you're buying cars, you're paying taxes on that. And so the size of the pie increases, you cut tax rates, but the size of the pie increases. So tax revenues might actually go up, might actually offset the tax cuts. So you're basically taking a smaller size of a larger pizza, you know, by cutting tax rates. So this was the theory. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and it doesn't work across the country. It did work in the IT sector in Ireland, <clears throat> in uh, solar cells, for example, in the US and Texas. <clears throat> when when Modi became president, prime minister, and uh, there was a whole talk of he was the Reagan of South Asia um, because he was talking low tax cuts and there was lots of hope. Um, so that's the reformist Modi we're talking about. And um, so that's how that happens. The deficit is contained by tax cuts. 
going back to um, Dr. Shahani's question here, um, you know, infrastructure projects, there is room for, in, for infrastructure, lots of room, lots of necessity. Migrants can do that. They really need help. They have been let down, that's obvious. And this is not a political statement, this is a leadership statement. And so somebody said, well, how do you do it? I mean, it's easy to talk. The answer is Adam Smith. Okay, Adam Smith basically said, and Aditya is resonating, so, which is good. And uh, Indu, I know you know enough economics, so she's smiling too. And so what you have here is, um, Adam Smith said, you can't force people. So here you are, you want a foreign company to come and build a huge power plant or a big roadway or some big plant in some part of Bihar or Madhya Pradesh or UP where these migrants really need help. So what you do is, Adam Smith taught us, you can't force people. You have to make it worth their while. You have to design the incentive structure such <clears throat> that they will behave in a way that we want them to behave and they make money in the process. For example, <clears throat> there was some wild mountain gorilla in Malawi, Africa, that was about to be extinct. And so they decided to deploy Adam Smith because you know poachers were coming and shooting these gorillas. So they did ecotourism, very expensive, only 20 rich tourists, 15, brought in by the Smithsonian or National Geographic, watching those gorillas from a distance, paying tons of money to the local community there. What happened is the local villagers started policing and making sure the poachers would come nowhere near the gorillas and all those Faltu guides, those guards who were allowing the poachers in and getting bribes, they were blocked because it paid to keep the gorillas alive. And now when you fast forward, those gorillas are off the endangered species list. They are off, there's so many of them now. <clears throat> Ecotourism and win, win, win. And so when the companies come to build a plant or do infrastructure in Bihar, what we do is we deploy Adam Smith. We say, Chachalo, you build the plant, but in two years, we want to see a school. We want to see a clinic for the local people there. And we want to see clean water dig 25 tube wells. And in two years, we will see how well the kids can read and write in the school. We will test the water. And only then will we in renegotiate or when we'll give you more of these low tax cuts. You're coming in on low tax cuts, low regulation, two years, we will see. Schools, water, clinic. If that works, then you will get tax cuts for another two years. Win, win, win. They will have to, they will do it, they'll play along. And so this is how we do government spending and we handle the migrants issue. Because, you know, talk is cheap. You know, we see all these WhatsApps, you know, people getting all torn and crying and oh my God, well, how badly they were treated. So talk is cheap. This is how we enact policy. Thanks, Farooq. So the next question comes from one of our young faculties, uh, Utsav Shroff, he's a faculty of finance. Uh, in Europe, we have negative yielding bonds. How do you think this will impact global bond markets? Yeah, so the negative thing is really, really strange. The way to look at negative yields, <clears throat> this is like your long-term Fisher effect inverting. Can't go into detail, but the way I see negative yields is very simply. When we talked about the liquidity trap, what, what that meant was people weren't borrowing and lenders were not lending. That's very important. Lenders have lost their shirts in the last crisis and unless you have a perfect credit, no one's lending. So what lenders were doing, financial institutions, they were parking the money at the central bank. They're just sitting. So the, the central bank had more reserves than it was supposed to have. You were just parking your money there. And so the central bank said, Chalo, if you want to park here, you have to pay parking fee you have to pay us to park money here, which is the negative interest rate. So by doing that, they were trying to foster these private banks to pull the money out from the central banks and lend it to Janta. That's the goal. Right, there's one, uh, uh, a generic question, uh, India-based. So how do you think India's economy will emerge post the lockdown? Uh, which is obviously complementing the fact that there's been an economic uh, stimulus in, in form of a package. You know, the, the CBAR and IBAR is high. In the corporate America, corporate India, there is frustration. Look, India wants to grow. Um, and what's interesting is 
one more time, we have another chance. There was one before the demonetization to Logaya, Janado. We have another chance. China is playing off the back foot. China is on defense, playing ball back to the bowler, off the back foot. US is preoccupied trying to get rid of Trump uh, and just trying to get through the day. Europe is in a mess. Probably there'll be a Eurozone fracture. Africa may be waking up in the next two, three years. I'm seeing glimmerings in Africa. But right now, once more, we have a chance at the goal. So the timing is again right. CBAR and IBAR are high. People are frustrated. You know, they want bold policy. What you have is Modi is pulled to the left. He's pulled to the right. So it doesn't do anything. He's in the middle. Tax cuts also, you know, little tweaking. Instead of cutting, he's transferring taxes from today to the future. A bold visionary policy like he did in Gujarat back in the day would work. We are very lucky. You know, CBAR and IBAR, they are not buttons you can press. You know, I can say, Aditya, Aditya, you know, confidence is high. On your way home today, go, no way home. We are already at home. From home, buy a car or something like that. It's not going to happen if confidence is low, right? And so we have that. And I can't think of any other economy right now which is straining. You know, you cut taxes 10% and the market is the highest in 10 years. That tells me this is a racehorse waiting to race. So infrastructure where we need it for the migrant workers, for the corporates, stop obsessing on global relationships and wearing expensive kurtas, you know, 10, five, 10 crore kurtas and all that sort of thing. Just focus on macro policy. I mean, look at Tata. When he eats at the Vivanta, nobody even knows that that's Tata sitting on the table and eating. He's in a bush shirt and chapels and the waiters said, Saab, account with, no, 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 he pays the bill. He actually pays. It's his hotel. Uh, and that, that's what I'm talking about. Right, so uh, there's another interesting question from uh, a student named Janvi. And uh, the question is, why is the US stock market booming despite the fiscal Oh my crisis? gosh. So, you're getting me all worked up here. Yeah, well, so you know, you have to understand, I'm not in the market and all the students who I warned about a week before the massive crash are thanking me profusely because we went all the way down to what, 17,000 or 19,000, 19,000. And so now again, we're coming up. Remember folks, when you print money, it's like water. It, when I say it sits there, it doesn't really sit there. It flows somewhere. It, that liquidity is flowing into the stock market. The big run up we saw after the housing crisis, 2008, 9, 10, was largely fueled by liquidity. And when Aditya sends you the blog tonight, tonight, tomorrow, there's a section in there on the stock market. And you have to be very, very careful with all this liquidity out there now, 10 trillion, who knows, 8 trillion, um, that is gonna go somewhere. Some of it will at least go in the stock market. And a liquidity driven rise in stocks goes up quickly and comes down quickly. And in my blog, I actually talk about something called Kindleberger Minsky. Once more, Kindleberger Minsky. There's a link in there. This is something the finance professors in, don't talk about because it's, there's no theory in it, but it's a plot of a bubble. And I said, you know, so I said, there's no theory, I know. There's no <clears throat> theoretical foundation, I know. But what happens in a crisis like we had now is macro trumps finance. Mac bad macro trumps good finance. So a macro, bad macro is like a tsunami that washes away the good seaside villages and the bad seaside villages. In other words, the good companies and the bad companies. Because when there's a collapse in confidence in the crisis, it's all emotional investing. <clears throat> all the price earning ratios, the Miller Milligliani theorem, capital asset pricing model, all that goes out the window. It's all emotional, macro tsunami, macro, bad macro trumps good finance. All the companies get washed out, good companies and bad companies. And so Kindleberger Minsky, for those of you who are interested, look at the plot tonight. It is very interesting. It talks about when there's a recovery, there's a false recovery, and it's just it was an emotional roller coaster ride when bubbles crash. But liquidity driven bubbles, another one is coming, guys, definitely coming. 
and you write it at your own risk. And you heard it here first. Right. Uh, so one last question and we'll close after this. Uh, what is America's gut feel on the presidential election? You know, the independents have swung away from him. Um, but his base is still in there. Um, um, so we just don't know. We're all hoping for a reassuring sign, especially after this, that we get him out of there. Otherwise, it'll be too bad. I'm right. I think, yeah, I think that brings us to the end of the session as far as uh, the delivery of your content and the questions and the answers. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lange. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Indu, thank you for inviting me. And it's, it's so good. Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. It's, oh, it's mine. It's mine. I look forward to the time that I, I can actually be there and see you folks again. And that